Hello everyone. Welcome to Mathematics, Physics, Mathematical Physics channel. Today we're going to talk about another episode of, One Problem at a Time, Mathematical Physics Edition. Here is the second problem in which we show that the Lorentz transformations form a group. So, let's do this. Today, our job is to prove that the Lorentz transformations form a group. Remember that the Lorentz transformations are characterized by this relation that means Lorentz transformations preserve the Minkowski metric. In this relation, lambda is a representation of the Lorentz transformation, lambda superscript t means transpose of the Lorentz transformation, and g is the Minkowski metric. We've proved this relation in the previous episode. Please find the link below in the description, or in the info card above, and see the proof. First of all, we review what kind of mathematical structure a group is. A group is simply composed of a set and an identified operation that is, basically, a map between the set members. A set along with the identified operation is called a group if and only if the following four conditions are satisfied. 1. The closure axiom it means that the operation between any two members of the set results in another member of the set. 2. Associativity, meaning that the operation on the set members must satisfy the associativity condition. 3. The existence of a unique identity member in the set, with respect to the identified operation. And 4. The existence of a unique inverse member for any member in the set, with respect to the identified operation. Now, let's discuss each of these conditions in great detail and prove them for the case of Lorentz transformations. As mentioned, a group is basically a set equipped with a general product rule. We call this set by G, and show its members by, lambda 1, lambda 2, etc. Here, each lambda represents a Lorentz transformation. Also, we represent the product operation by a dot. Note that the product operation is generally an abstract notion for a functional map and does not necessarily mean multiplication. In other words, each operation is a map that takes two members of the group as the inputs and generates another member of the group as the output. In function language, this means that the product is identified as a map on the Cartesian product of the group with itself to the group. Thus, the domain of the map is, G Cartesian product by G, and the codomain is G. A hint on the notation. Often people remove the dot as a symbol of the product and they only write the members next to each other. Now. Let's discuss the closure axiom for the group. The closure axiom states that the identified product operation for the group which is applied on the set G, must be closed on the set. This basically means that the codomain of the product operation must be G which is the group itself so that the result of each operation among the group members must not fall outside the set. We check this axiom for the group of Lorentz transformations. We show that if lambda 1 and lambda 2 are Lorentz transformations so that they separately satisfy this relation, then their product, lambda 1 lambda 2, is Lorentz transformation because it satisfies this relation as well. This is simple to show. We insert the product of lambda 1 and lambda 2 on the left hand side of the equation. Knowing that the transpose of a product is the product of the transposes in the inverse order, we get this form. Next, we group the three terms in the middle involving lambda 1. Since lambda 1 is already a Lorentz transformation, it preserves the metric. So, we replace the collection with the metric. In addition, since lambda 2 is a Lorentz transformation, it also preserves the metric. So, the whole term can be replaced by the metric here. Thus, we show that the product of any two Lorentz transformations satisfies the metric preservation. So, we claim that the product of any two Lorentz transformations is also a Lorentz transform. With this, we conclude the proof of the closure axiom. The next step is to prove the associativity property of the Lorentz transformations. The associative property states that for the product or operation among more than two group members the way in which factors are grouped does not change the product. This is also very simple to prove. We don't need to do anything, but just noting that the Lorentz transformations are linear transformations acting on some vector space called the Minkowski space. So, we can represent these linear transformations with 4 by 4 matrices on the basis of 4 vector representations for each point inside the Minkowski vector space. Then, by adopting this representation, each group operation among the Lorentz transformation simply turns into the matrix product. Finally, 
By remembering that matrix product approve the associative property we can conclude that Lorentz transformations also a b associative property. The third step is to prove the existence of the identity or unit member. This requirement states that there is a member, called identity or unit member, belonging in the group that the product of this member either from left or right with any other member gives the other member. In order to prove this property, we again need to recall our knowledge from matrices. Remember that the n by n identity matrix, called I n, is the unit matrix for the product of n by n matrices. Here, we are dealing with a four-dimensional vector space. So, the 4 by 4 identity matrix, I4, is a candidate for the unit element of the group of Lorentz transformations. We only need to check whether this identity matrix is inside this group or not. In other words, we have to show that this unit matrix is a Lorentz transformation, and hence, obeys the metric preservation relation. This is a trivial relation and can be seen by the matrix multiplication. So, I4 is a Lorentz transformation, and thus, is a unit member for the group of Lorentz transformation. The fourth and final step is to show the existence of an inverse element for each member of the Lorentz transformation set and find it. This is a two-step job. First, we have to show that there exists an inverse for each Lorentz transformation, and second, we need to find the inverse. In order to prove the existence of the inverse, we again need to borrow our knowledge about matrices. We know that a matrix has an inverse if and only if it has a non-zero determinant. So, we have to show that the determinant of the lambda matrix is non-zero. For that, we take the determinant of both sides of the metric preserving relation. The determinant of the product of matrices is equal to the product of the determinants of the matrices. Also, the determinant of the transpose of a square matrix is equal to the determinant of the matrix. Applying all these points yields that the square of the determinant of the Lorentz transformation matrix is 1. So, we conclude that the determinant of the Lorentz transformation matrix is either plus 1 or minus 1, which means the determinant is non-zero. Hence, the matrix or the transformation is invertible and for sure there exists an inverse. Now, it's time to find the inverse, which we symbolize it by lambda to the minus 1. To find the inverse we again begin with this equation. We apply the product of the inverse element to both sides of the equation from the right. Noting that lambda multiplied by its inverse gives the unit member or the identity matrix, we obtain this equation. Now, we multiply both sides by the inverse of metric from the left. Again, since on the right hand side, the metric matrix is multiplied by its inverse we get the identity matrix. So, by simplification, we obtain the inverse Lorentz transformation. Moreover, we can give each component of this inverse matrix. Here, by using the Einstein notation convention, we distribute the component indices inside the matrix multiplication for the right-hand side of the equation. Now, look at this middle term on the right-hand side. It is the component of the lambda transpose matrix in the row column and sigma row. This can be written in terms of the components of the lambda matrix, simply by interchanging the column and row indices. Note that the sigma and rho indices for the components of the lambda matrix have been moved to the left and right, respectively. Remember that, for the matrix representation of a rank 2 tensor, the leftmost index shows the columns and the rightmost index shows the rows. Also, we know that the inverse of the metric matrix is the same as the matrix matrix. So, finally, each component of the inverse Lorentz transform is given by this relation. Perfect. We proved all the requirements needed to show that the Lorentz transformations form a group. It is of great importance to notice that we proved everything by utilizing one and only one equation by which we identify the Lorentz transformations. By this, we conclude this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to turn on the notification bell, so you won't miss future episodes. Keep in mind that the aim of this channel is to represent the beauty of mathematics and physics, and the pure connection between them. So, watch other videos on our channel, and support us with your comments and suggestions.